Good afternoon. Welcome to Finding Happiness in Hard Times. I think we've got a good show for you today. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Today, I'm going to reach back in the past and talk to a good friend of mine who I haven't seen for over 50 years in person. Uh, but we've been emailing recently and talking recently, and he's agreed to come on the show. I'd like to introduce and welcome my good friend, Al Paul, to the show. Al, great to have you. Thanks uh, for having me, Ken. And uh, I just want to let your audience know that we met uh, up in Alaska in 1967. I was a brand new second lieutenant, and you took me under your wings. And you were a great mentor and teacher. And uh, uh, I can never thank you enough for what you did for me up there and protected me from all the people up there. And uh, <laughs> I just want hey, you it was to my know, pleasure, Al. No, but uh, I just want you to know that uh, the skills that you that you showed me, I used for many, many years uh, with my law students. And uh, uh, I never, I can't thank you enough for that. Well, I have to tell the audience, Al has had a see, really spectacular career. I mean, he went uh, from being an officer in the Army to uh, being a lawyer for many years and then to being a judge. And uh, I'm in awe of that. Uh, we both, as a psychologist, of course, I deal with people that have many troubles. But uh, I think Al has me beat in there. When you come to the courtroom and see so many people who are not only in trouble, but... Uh, angry, angry at self and angry at their partner, especially for hanging, handling something like divorce or inheritance uh, problems, you know, and cases. Uh, and Al has done a spectacular job and I'm sure it reached many more people than I have. So uh, while I may have been his mentor for a few short years in Alaska, he's he's been my idol uh, for a long time and the stuff that he's done and helped people. We'll, we'll get into that. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, putting this in with the past programs. Now, the past programs, we've tried to deal with the negativity that the coronavirus and all the other negative things that have been happening in the world, uh, the mass shootings, the war, climate change, and all that. And so for the past number of months, we've been really focusing on battling negativity with positivity. We've been looking at the joys that... Uh, that people had, and they've been sharing that with, with the audience and with us. And uh, that's a way to really get people out of that paralysis that negativity puts us in. But the thing is, this is not an easy thing. Finding happiness is easier said than done. And uh, I know it's been difficult for a lot of people, and it's been difficult for Al and his family. And I, I want to really start talking about that, because when Al and I talked about this, and I asked him about how the uh, the lockdown of the last three years had sort of affected uh, him and his family, and he said, well, it hasn't really affected us much at all, because we have been in lockdown a long time. So, Al, I think that's a good place to start. Can we yeah. can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how long you've been in lockdown and how that happened? Okay. Uh, in 1979, uh, July uh, 21st. My son was born. His name was Danny, a very healthy, nine pound, 23 inch baby boy. Uh, my wife and I are tall, so we kind of knew he was going to be a big one. But when for, what unfortunately happened is that about three months after he was born, uh, we noticed that he did not move. And uh, we took him to the pediatrician and he said, uh, yeah, that's not normal. I'm going to send you to uh, a very prominent pediatric uh, neurologist from Mayo Clinic. And we went to see him. And he examined Danny. He did an EC, EEC test and came out and told us this. Now we're sitting there with a four month old perfect baby boy. And he said, Your son has spinal muscular atrophy. And, uh, there's no cure, and his life expectancy is two to four years. And walked out of the room, two minutes, and we're sitting there going, the world just ended. And what happened thereafter is for three years, I was very depressed. Um, 
my wife and my son handled it better than I did. Now, when we got home, my wife just said, well, this is what we got. There's nothing we can do about it. We're going to enjoy every day, month, year, no matter how long he lives. And for three years, I was, I just was shocked. So I, 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 didn't, I didn't do well. But one day, one of my colleagues, Jim Alex, who unfortunately recently passed away, and this is quite a story. He used to give me a ride home because I was so down. And we're leaving the loop in Chicago, and we have to go over a river. And he knows I can't swim. And he was a great swimmer. He says, Al, you've got to snap out of this. You're not doing yourself any good. You're not doing the Indian wife any good. So he pulls, stops over to on the bridge over the Chicago River, goes to my side of the door, opens the door. He says, Al, you got two tents in Get on that bridge and jump off. Or go home and take care of me. You're not doing him any good. You're not doing yourself any good. And so we entered the world of wheelchairs, uh, constant infections, two years probably out of his first six. Uh, we were at Children's Memorial Hospital with pneumonia and touch and go as to whether or not he would make it. And the second phase of it happened in 1986, which is when I was elected judge. One month to the day later, the Friday after Thanksgiving, he arrested and was dead. We revived him. They took him to Children's Memorial and they tricked him because he couldn't breathe anymore. And from, from November 1986 to today, the first day of summer of 2023, I've been with Danny every day of his life because he's a quadriplegic, not a ventilator, and he leads 24 7. And uh, thereafter, the journey began 24 hours a day. 365 days a year, we have to take care of the Indian. But the one thing that Jimmy told me was enjoy the Indian. And that's where I came to grips with it because danny has got 165 IQ. He's a joy. He's fun. He's got a will to live like nobody I know. Uh, he almost died in 2011. He almost died in 2019. Uh, but he is my best friend. And he is a great source of joy to me because he's humorous. He's so hysterical. He's funny. And his intellect is so good that he's always coming up with great things to say and great one-liners. You know, at night, we have our two hours of boys. I pull the computer over I do his emailing because he has no use of his hands. I put him on the bedpan. And his emails are hysterical. As Ken, as you know, he sends you some. And uh, he's my best friend. And because of that, and as Jimmy told me, I'll take one day at a time. We don't know if you get tomorrow. And, and that was my, I had to discover myself. And I had to discover what I had to do in order to get joy back into my life. Well, uh, yeah, I have to tell the audience that uh, ever since Al and I reconnected, uh, which was a number of years ago, uh, we've been emailing because I haven't been able to get back to Chicago and uh, Al and Danny haven't been able to get to Hawaii. So, uh, but I emailed to both Danny and Al. They have uh, a joint email account. So over the years, uh, I feel that Danny is my friend, just as Al is my friend. And I hope that Danny feels that way about me because I, oh, I certainly feel that. And uh, he, said uh, all the, he said all the emails he gets, you're the cleverest. You're absolutely <laughs> the best writer we get. I mean, you really should write the great, the great American novel. But, uh, <laughs> well, that, that's very nice of me to say. And, you know, and I, I really appreciate both Al and Danny a lot. And it's always, uh, 
you know, sometimes when you're emailing, uh, you have to email uh, not only business people, but friends, you know, I mean, it's, but it's always a joy emailing uh, Danny and Al. And, um, and that has got me a little bit into their world. Um, and Al has given us uh, some indication of that. Um, maybe you could just, before we go on and to talk about, uh, you've already mentioned uh, one of three things that bring you joy. Because I asked Al at the beginning of the show, I said, uh, tell me the things that bring you joy. And he said, three things. Danny brings me joy. Bicycling brings me joy. And certain parts of my job as a judge brings me joy. So and we've got three things to talk about. And he's already given us a little bit about his, uh, you know, his feelings toward uh, Danny. But uh, maybe just a little bit more because I, you know, one of the things that <clears throat> has struck me doing shows during the coronavirus is that so many people are alone. You know, they've been separated from uh, people that they really care about. And you and Danny have not been separated. You've been walking down this difficult road, not only difficult uh, for you, but recently di difficult for the whole world, which really adds to things. Uh, and yet the two of you are doing this hand in hand. You know, you're in, and that's amazing. And that's uh, that's got to be incredible. So if you could talk a little bit more about that is, uh, because so many people out there, have been alone during the lockdown and are still not reconnected or, you know, close to somebody like you are close to Danny. Maybe you could get us, give us a little bit more of that. And then maybe we can go in and talk about bicycling, which is another area that I really love. And I know that it, it has brought me joy and a lot of my friends joy. And I'm, I'm anxious to hear about your experiences there too. But first, if you can give us a little bit more about you and Danny. Yeah, because the situation is, is that we literally can't go out. You know, joke in the neighborhood is uh, uh, whenever you go to see the Pauls, you don't have to worry about them not being home because 40% of my house is a hospital. You know, it's the lifts and the ventilators and the suction machines and the vibrator percussors that keep us chest open and we're always home. So uh, our, our, our sphere of friends is, is diminished because, you know, we can't socialize because all day, the, the day is just filled with his treatment, his feeding, which takes a long time because he can only open up his mouth very little and you have to give him small bites. Uh, and, and we have to move him around so he doesn't get bed sores. Uh, so we've been in lockdown from day one. I mean, we had masks and gloves and uh, there were no hand sanitizers in 1986. It was called soap and water in those days. <laughs> so we're always home uh, we don't go anywhere so we have to make our own fun and consequently uh, Danny, that's why Danny and I are, are so close And I, I, I'll tell you two great quips that he gave me one time he gets frustrated when I email a type for him because I'm the world's worst speller so one day he was disgusted and he says how did you get through college <laughs> And the other one, he was frustrated again with me because I wasn't doing something right. Is, you know, if I owned the company, I wouldn't hire you. So <laughs> that's the sort of relationship he and I have is that, I, I mean, he's just incredibly smart. But we have to make our own fun because we can't go anywhere. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, you have... You know, and I think a lot of parents would be envious of the fact that you and Danny talk so much. You know, a lot yeah, of the parents that I, I know, they say, hey, my kid never talks to me, you know, uh, you know, and it's very frustrating. But you guys talk all the time. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you and you and Danny enjoy talking about? For instance, I know that you guys are sports, uh, sort of sports. sports. Big sport, big yeah, sport fans. I, we talked about tennis and, uh, you know, not only the connection to Chicago, but to uh, Poland. Yes, you know, we have the uh, the best female tennis player in the world is from Poland now. Yes, so uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, our conversations uh, are uh, are basically about sports. Uh, a lot of it deals with his medical conditions and is the insurance company going to pay? Uh, we always have to deal with uh, whether or not you know the, the biggest thing we have every end of the month, which is coming up now at the end of June, is how many 
versus what we're going to have in July. But you know, we already know there isn't going to be one for the 4th of July. So we have our two hours of boy talk, no women. Mom is has to go to her bedroom. We turn we turn on the music and and and, and the thing with Danny is this: he he's right, but he also knows for the rest of his life, he has to get along with people. He has people skills that are unbelievable. That I mean, he's had nurses for thirty six years, thirty four years, thirty one years. 29 years. The one that was here today has been with him 34 years. She refers to herself as the Jewish mother to my Catholic son. So, uh, and consequently, because of the limitations that we have, and you know, he's not a ventilator. He can't go anywhere. I mean, when we take him like to the dentist, or if we every once in a while we take him to a movie, we need either a respiratory therapist or a nurse, or we can't go. You got to take the ventilator. You got to bring the lift up and the lift down, and you have to put the vests on them. And uh, consequently, I am so happy that we get along so well. And, and he truly is my best friend, and you know, and we have a wonderful, wonderful relationship. And uh, um, and his outlook on life is is much better than mine. And he is a survivor. And as much as I love him, I respect him even more. It's just a terrific human being. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's, get, let's get to the bicycling. I have my bike behind me over here. And because of the the mentoring and teaching skills that you taught me up at Murphy Dome, I mentor new judges that I have been for 18 years. I've done wow. 10. I just, got, I just got done with one. And I did law students for since 1992, uh, and one of the things with Danny is, is that he has taught me wonderful people skills in order to uh, get along with people. So the last judge I mentored needed a lot of mentoring. He just needed a lot of help. And, and <laughs> I, I think because having a child like Danny, uh, and emptying a bedpan every night. You get humble, and the one thing you taught me, Ken, was always be a good listener. And people would express to me, and because of what I went through and the heartache and the pain I had, I think I'm much more sensitive to people who are also having problems. And I'm a better listener. And I'm the avuncular uncle, or as I used to refer to myself, I'm Judge Valium. I'm like a soft sofa. <laughs> Judge Valium, I like that. I like that phrase. <laughs> well, and he bought me a nine hundred dollar bike. He's a very wealthy kid. Uh-huh. Other is, and, and you can you can take gifts from judges. You can't take gifts from lawyers. <laughs> and, and he and I will be friends forever. I mean, he still calls me, and I I haven't met him in two years. So, uh, that is. Some some skills and the bike. The biking for me is my therapy. I haven't had any alcohol in thirty years. I used to like to have mine, but even though my given my ethnicity, we, we're noted for liking it. But so I get up early in the morning. I ride my bike. I'm very competitive. I'm not out there cruising around. I'm going hard, and I can still do sixty miles an hour. So. I'm, and uh, it, 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 it is, there's, there's a difference between loneliness and solitude. And that bicycle gives me some solitude. And it gives you the, I think, what's it called, endomorphs that, you know, you get, you feel better. Uh, you're, you're, your blood's flowing and you sleep better at night. So that bicycling is very important to me. I ride it all year round. If it's 120 heat index like it was here today in Chicago, I ride. If it's 35 degrees below windshield, Ken, you've seen my pictures with the icicles and my mustache. Uh, so that's my therapy. That's my other sense of joy. Wow. Yeah, I, they, I wish we could show uh, the audience one of those pictures because I love it with you and the bicycle and piles of snow yes. behind you and 
that it, uh, you know, that's something that I've uh, never experienced. We did a, a lot of bicycling when I first came to Hawaii. We bicycled around uh, most of the islands, and it was truly a yeah a a personal high. Uh, and interestingly, you talk because most of it's with uh, my friends, groups of people that were. You know, we were traveling around and, and camping out as we biked around the islands. But a couple of times I did it alone. And I'm not a fast bicycler like you are. I'm one of those people that sort of lollygag around and look at, you know, the beautiful mountains and the ocean and things like that. But this one day, uh, I had to get back to work. This was in the 1970s. And uh, we were on Maui. And we were out at Tana. And uh, I had to get back. And in those days, we had a... a a ferry, uh, which we don't have between islands anymore. And then the ferry was wonderful because you could take your bicycle aboard and uh, you didn't have to rent a car when you got to the island. You could just take your bicycle and bicycle off the uh, the boat, the ship, and uh, take off. And uh, so I had to get back there. I had to leave the group. And to get back from Hana to where we were going out of Kihei uh, to get to the boat, we had to do it. I had to get up like at, uh, I think it was five in the morning I got up. It was yeah. still dark. And it was just me and traveling along the ha Hana Highway, which is a spectacular highway. Yeah. And uh, I had to go flat out. You know, very few times have I experienced something like you experience all the time where I'm going flat out and uh, going around those curves and everything. It was just, it's hard to describe. It's an yeah. incredible high. And uh, I'm just going for everything, and uh, and everybody's still asleep, you know. And I'm all alone, and uh, you know, and I'm bicycling through the middle of the island as the sun's coming up. And I just thought, wow, this is Nirvana. Uh, one of those, yeah, Nirvana. It's it's one of those points. So I'm totally envious. I can't uh, I can't compete with you, and I can't bicycle anymore because my balance is not as good as it used to be. You know, age is catching up to me, and I think you're. Much better shape. So, um, with my balance not very good, I've had to stay away from bicycling, which I love. So, like I said, I'm envious, and I think that uh, that certainly is a way to find joy is in bicycling. Uh, and I think you've certainly found it. Well, you're a Californian, my friend. When there's something there called Highway One, yeah, along the coast, along the coast, yeah, he's very that famous. Was his, that was his greatest bicycle adventure. He yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, so it is. Need, and it's it's a great place to hike too. You know, I mean, yeah. you go off the road and you hike back up into the mountains and look down into Big Sur and you know Half Moon Bay and places like that, and you just say, "Wow." Well, let's get, we we have five minutes left, Ken, and I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah, let's go to the well, let's go to the judging yeah, because the uh, let me introduce that because sure. uh, this is one of the things that I've been really uh, asking Al about because we do very similar things. And, and I think he has an inside track into reaching people. And I did a lot of family therapy in my career. And yeah. uh, he has to work with families uh, for a variety of reasons uh, that contain a lot of toxicity. And he told me about mediation and how mediation yeah. gives him the high. So let me turn over to him. And so he can tell us a little bit how mediation brings people together rather than too often litigation takes people apart further. Yeah. Uh, and mediation uh, sounds wonderful. So take it away on mediation, Al. Tell sure. us about uh, it. I never did domestic relations. That's, that was not my thing. But the mediation I did was in, in uh, commercial litigation, personal injury, uh, that sort of stuff. And the court system, you know, if you were assigned a case, you had a calendar, you had a, you know, thousand cases uh if you had a case that was going to be a close call uh sometimes the party I, you would recommend the parties and say look judge uh ken burton is you know he's in another division he he takes cases in the morning to mediate you get a fresh eye in front of me somebody's gonna win or lose you get a, you get a whole loaf or you get no loaf if you go to judge burton is, who really is a schmoozer he knows how to get people together. And the first thing you do when the parties agree to that, you send them to Judge Burtness. You have a fresh eye. And what you are doing is you're mediating. You cannot resolve the case. You do three things in mediation. First of all, 
you separate the parties and say, let's talk about the issues. What's the problem here? Okay. And then you give them the three pluses of the mediation. Number one, if the case settles, it's over. There is no appeal. I tried a case one time, the appellate process took 17 months. And the third thing you do is the parties settle the case. They resolve it. So when Judge Bertness gets it, he is in effect the mediator between two people. And the first thing you have to do is get rid of the toxicity. Stop hating each other. And what do you want? You want a half a loaf or do you want no loaf? A very famous barrister said, the big courthouse in London uh, said the following, a bad settlement is better than a good trial. It saves money and the parties control the outcome, not a judge, not a jury. That's the important thing about mediation is the parties walk away, shake, they typically shake hands and they say, okay, I got a half a loaf. This case is over. So wow. mediation is a great way to resolve disputes and the court system has done a good job in uh, I used to retry a case every morning before my regular call started. And uh, I'm proud to say in 1994, I made the Chicago lawyer because I had the most million dollar settlements in that year. And the next year, my mentor did $29 million settlements and I did 28. So uh, it's very important. And those people went away and they went away happy and they settled the case. It was over. And that's why mediation it is terrific. Yeah. And that's why I said I, mean, I did it for 25 years. That's great. And you know what? Uh, you know, and some people can do it and some people can't. I was a good back <laughs> slapper. I could have sold a lot of ice in, in Canada, you know, believe me. And some people just, <laughs> some people don't have the neck. Yeah. It's like people can hit a curveball. Some people can't. Yeah. Now, you know, we're, as you can see, we're about out of time, Al. Uh, just uh, you have any last minute words for people who are, Looking at their life, thinking, "Gee, it is just impossible. How am I going to get through this?" If you got, if you got well, anything that you can, you can yes, a, a little bit of advice you could give them. Yeah, uh, and I was at that point uh, when Jimmy stopped his car over the Chicago River and said, "What you have to do, you have to do two things. You have to find out what the path you're going to cross and go, and you got to find out about yourself." My wife handled it much better than I did. I didn't. It took me three years, but I had to sit down and say, look, I can't go on this way. And what Jimmy said to me made sense. You're not doing yourself any good. You're not doing yourself any good. And my wife said it the best when you not. That, that neurologist walked out and said he was going to be dead in two, uh, two years and there's no cure. Have a good day. Bye. Okay. What do we do? Yeah. We enjoy him for as long as we got them. And that's it. She did it in one day. It took me three years. And, right. it, and it's, not, it's not easy. And, and people like you can, can help people by sitting them down and talk to somebody, maybe a third part, a third person, but you have to know the journey you're going to take and you have to really find out about yourself. And I was not as good as my wife and I was not as good as my son, but Jimmy helped. So I had, and he was Greek, so he always used to call himself the Greek lawyer. And all of Western civilization should kneel at the Greeks' feet because they come up with all the great ideas. And unfortunately, Jimmy died two years ago, and I miss him to this day. But he he he, he saved me. He really did. And I, I can't thank him on Well, that's terrific. Al, thank you so much for, for being on this program and, and sharing with us. I know... Uh, well, I'm sorry. I almost, like, I, I'm sorry. I almost broke up. But hey, I, that was you know, you talk from the heart, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. That is, that is a gift, and uh, you gave us that gift today. And I appreciate that. Uh, so thanks again, and uh, also let me. Uh, I want to thank uh, the people here at Think Tech Hawaii as always, uh, Jay and Haley and uh, Michael 
and Ash and everybody who supports this. And I want to thank the audience um, who's been with us today. And I hope you enjoyed the show and got some good messages that Al had to give us today. Um, now, in two weeks, uh, tune in. I'll be talking with uh, artist extraordinaire uh, Patrice Federspiel. And uh, we're going to talk about how art and life intersect. So hope you'll join us for that in two weeks. And in the meantime, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.